Uh, my name is Tammy Gold, and I'm a professor of documentary production at Hunter College. And I'm a filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, and an artist, and an activist. Um, so I see my work really as the kind of braiding of these three elements. My name is Shasha Feng. I'm a professor at Hunter College. I teach um, art installation and media production. Some of my work include um, web-based technology all the way to open source to physical art installations. And today we're going to talk a little bit about our work together. Okay, so the project that Shasha and I are doing is called Surveillance, Silence Equals Death. Um, I wanted to start with a little context before we talked specifically about the project. And the, um, it's a public art installation. And some of the context is, how does our fear support surveillance? How does culture play on our fears? How does collective anxiety work and where does it come from? How does a culture of fear justify increased surveillance? So in order to really understand the installation that we're doing that's in development, I have a few stories to highlight. The enemy cannot be seen, but it is always there. And it's always a threat to our safety and to our way of life. Here are some examples. Right now on television, we see an enormous growth of TV series. One is called The Americans. The Americans is a new American TV drama that was created and produced by a former CIA agent, officer, set during the Cold War period of the 1980s. The Americans is a story of two Soviet KGB officers posing as an American married couple with two children who do not know their parents as Soviet spies. The parents look like typical white American middle class people. They learned to speak English as adults, perfect English, without a hint of a Russian accent. Now, I come from a family of Eastern Europeans. Never did anyone lose their accent. <laughs> this family lives in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and their neighbor is an FBI counterintelligence agent who they fool, fool into believing they are your typical suburban neighbor. The reality is they, this Russian, English-speaking, without accent couple, are our enemy. They look like us, well, some of us. They kill. They lie. They do whatever they have to do. And it's not important to the viewer why. All that is important is that they are our enemy, so whatever course it takes, we need protection. Homeland, and some of you might be angry for me to critique Homeland. So the first show, Americans, is, is, produced by, is written by a former CIA agent. Homelands is an American drama thriller TV program based on an Israel-Israeli series, again, written and influenced by the Israeli military. And the name of that show is Prisoners of War. Homeland is an edge-of-the-seat edge sensation. Sergeant Brody, I don't know if you've seen it, is a United States Marine Corps scout sniper who has been held captive by Al-Qaeda as a prisoner of war who was turned by the enemy and now threatens the United States. But no one really knows this. He is the enemy living among us. He looks like us, some of us. Red hair, blue eyes. The CIA officer in the show is Carrie, and she's tops in her field despite being bipolar. And her form of bipolar is for a different panel about how mental illness is represented in the media. Um, and this, they have a delicate dance between these two characters. Their relationship is built on lies, suspicion, and desire. It, at, at the heart of this gripping thriller is the fact that our nation is at stake. stake. Again, the enemy is among us, but we can't see it. 
Homeland is considered one of the best post-9-11 dramas. The fact that it's called that really presents a problem to me, that there's a best post-9-11 drama. The Boston Globe says, I'm hooked. Entertainment Weekly gives it an A-. minus. IGN TV calls Homeland a thriller that also manages to say something about the war on terror. <laughs> President Obama has praised Homeland and is also known to be a fan of the show. What do these shows say about our safety? How do they protect ourselves? Or how do we protect ourselves? What are we willing to give up for protection? Just a few more examples. The subliminal message in our environment, very connected to John Jay. There's a book that just came out called The New York Tapes. Do you know this book? It's a shocking story of cops, cover-up, and courage. It's a nonfiction by the author and journalist Graham Raymond. And he writes about the Hercules team, which is an elite, heavy-armed, special force type of police unit that pops up daily around New York City. It's the creation of Commissioner Kelly. This team can be seen at the Empire State Building, the Brooklyn Bridge, Times Square, Stock Exchange, wherever the day's intelligence report suggests that it is need needed. This small team arrives in black suburban, uh, uh, how do you say that word? Suburbans? You know, cars. Subarus, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> they carry nine millimeter submarine guns. They consist of an intelligence officer, a canine unit, highway patrol unit, and a small squad of heavily armed police officers who travel throughout the city. Their purpose is to intimidate and to publicly mount a show of force. And as a visual reminder that the NYPD is present, and prepare for the worst case scenario. Again, we need them. Though Commissioner Kelly claims that the Hercules team are to fight terrorists, much like the ADT warning sign in front of a house that frightens away burglars. Their other objective, and perhaps a more important one, is to send a message that danger is always present and the American people need protection at whatever cost. The police commissioner now has the ST, STU unit, and it's on his desk. Secured telephone unit, and it's a phone line that enables him to talk to the White House and to the pe Pentagon without being monitored. Interesting. When a key is turned on, when the conversation is going on, and it's electronically encrypted. Many New Yorkers have seen the gradual change in the NYPT's operate operations since 9-11. However, we need to consider the psychological impact all this has on the public. Now, there's also the critical response vehicle, and this deploys the Hercules team, where both the NYPD almost immediately after 9-11 were created. They remain an active part of the uh, active part, sorry, to counter terrorism today. The CRV deployment consists of dozens of patrol cars flashing their lights while driving through the city without a special purpose. <laughs> their purpose is to drive with flashing lights. It goes on. There's teams of officers that randomly perform transit order maintenance sweeps. It's called TOMS. In every car of the subways, and they are there to check for suspicious activity or packages by a team of officers coordinating with subway personnel. These arm units work throughout the subway system. Journalist and author Graham Rayan, Rayman writes that these units exist to increase public fear and 
collective anxiety resulting in a public that is unconsciously frightened, a public that lives with increased anxiety, a public that can rationalize the need for secrecy, even surveillance at whatever cost. So in that context, understanding the context that we are living in, I was thinking of many of the pieces of artifacts that I had collected post 9-11. And I'll give a little context to this. Um, within the months of the attack on the World Trade Center, President George Bush went on the airwaves and reassured the American people that the nation was secure and life should go on as usual. He encouraged Americans to remain patriotic and as a symbol of patriotism, the American people should go shopping. You might remember this. This project, Surveillance, Silence Equal Death, Equals Death, is a multimedia installation in development. It is the response to these words and to a, our cultural industry that promotes fear. This installation will be created from purchased products available after 9-11, as you see behind me, these products, playing cards that were sold by the, near the World Trade Center, children's coloring books illustrating America's political and military achievements, candles decorated with the monuments of American fallen soldiers, bear mugs with flags, toilet paper with bin Laden's face, hot sauce with pro-war pro slogans, sugar wrappings in the flags, and other patriotic household products. So images like this were collected right after 9-11, and they were sold right near the, the attack, and this was literally in weeks following 9-11. Um, we will create larger-than-life pieces of arts of hands. And as some of you might remember, that when 9-11 happened, prior to the war, within the first year, maybe 2001 to 2002, there was a development of these new souvenirs, which were decks of cards. And some of the decks of cards showed our enemy. And our enemy was very grotesque and were the Iraqi military and the Iraqi people. Um, and then they had the other deck of cards, which related to our wonderful military and um, I don't know if we have, do we have some of those? These are some of the decks of cards. The female, um, as you can see, the Joker, maybe we go full scroll. The Joker, by the way, is made in Taiwan. Um, these are images from the decks of cards. And the installation that we're doing is going to focus on different aspects. And it's kind of a complicated notion of public art that's going to live in public spaces and also in in indoor spaces. And um, it, the first thing that we're going to show in the, in the installation, and we'll show you here, here's the toilet paper. Did you notice that with wipeout terrorism? And it has Bin Laden on it. Um, one of the things that we will look at is whistleblowers. And today, as, we, as those of you who were here for the full um, day's symposium, today's whistleblowers have come under unprecedented attack by the Obama administration, who evoked the Espionage Act of 1917. The chilling effect, such as prosecutions, can have a profound and further insulate those in power from any kind of accountability to their actions. Impenetrable secrecy was part of what allowed the Bush administration to encourage, to engage in torture, systematic abuse, and escalating wars. Obama's era has been defined by an expansion of the secrecy and the expansion of war, if not the same policies themselves as the Bush administration. Our installation will challenge secrecy, encourage the public to examine the, stra the strategic importance of a free society and that a free society must protect our whistleblowers. Okay. Okay, thank, 
Yes. Okay. Shasha. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our process and our, the inspiration. Then I'll show you the piece to give you a frame. Um, so why art? Why did we use art as a medium and a, a tool? We use it as a tool to promote transparency and social responsibility. Also to cause dialogue and thought and questions in a non-threatening kind of way. Um, the technique that we're using is culture jamming, and that's a way of subver uh, subverting and a spin, putting a spin on familiar things. So for example, things like ads that are modified, that's an example. Um, just challenging things going on. And for example, even flash mobs or reappropriating space. And most recently, if you've been around the city, you've seen Banksy's artwork. And whether you like it or not, it causes controversy and conversation. And um, our art installation is inspired by these cards that I just showed you, but we're going to put a spin on that. The cards we're going to use as a metaphor for life, how random things are. You're given things in life, and sometimes you don't have a choice. And these people, the whistleblowers, they were given situations randomly, and they chose to do something about it. And we want to feature them and their stories and bring awareness to people and give them a voice. And with the audio and the multimedia, um, it gives the audience an immersive experience, and also by giving them a voice, it tells you the personal ramifications of their decisions and how it affected them and their families. So I'm going to show you an example of our work in progress. Can someone lower the lights? the sound come up and landed private first class Bradley Danning it was the video that put WikiLeaks on the map turned the tide of war in Iraq and landed private first class Bradley Danning in military detention but for army veteran Ethan McCord it was just another day on duty the helicopters are approximately about a mile and a half away come on fire we hear the apaches firing Ethan and his infantry squad began running toward the scene to provide support. Again, the Apache helicopter opened fire. Come on. When he arrived on the scene, the Apache guns were quiet. The accused enemies were dead. I just drove over a body. <laughs> yeah. One guy's head was come the top of his head was completely off and his brains were, were One on week the before my unit was scheduled to return back to the United States. I was raped by another service member that had worked with our team. Initially, I chose not to do a report of any kind because I had no faith in my chain of command. As my first sergeant previously had sexual harassment accusations against him, and the unit climate was extremely sexist and hostile in nature towards women. She says back in the United States, at a base in Missouri, she ran into the man who raped her. I was so re-traumatized from the unexpectedness of seeing him when that I removed myself from training and immediately sought out the assistance from an army chaplain who told me, among other things, that the rape was God's will and that God was trying to get my attention so that I would go back to church. Rebecca Haverier spoke no. at a Senate hearing it's on sexual fair. violence in the military. So we are being punished for him doing the right thing. To keep Joe and Bernadette safe, the military moved them to an army base with bodyguards around the clock. I couldn't go anywhere. It was Joseph Darby who spoke out when others looked the other way. I went to Iraq with 200 of the finest servicemen I've ever seen in my life. But those 200, for the rest of their lives, their unit is going to carry a bad name because of what seven individuals did. The general called Darby courageous for blowing the whistle. Did you want the pictures to be leaked to the media? No, not at all. I never thought it would be anything that the media would, would get a hold of. And even if they did, I didn't think it would be as big as it was. Do you wish that it wasn't you who was given those CDs? No, because if they'd been given to somebody else, might not have been reported. And would that have been so bad if it had never been reported? Ignorance is bliss, they say, but to actually know what they were doing, you can't stand by and let that happen. So this is a small excerpt of what we're working on, and um, with the different voices, we want to create a symphony, and an interactive symphony of these stories that you can access. Um, one thing is, we could put it in a gallery, and as the audience, when you're walking into a gallery, you expect to see artwork, and you're in that framework. So we can make you think that way. But also, we're thinking about public space as well. 
Um, how do we take public space where you're walking, you know, doing your own thing every day, and putting this out there to make people think um, without expecting to think, and also to bring this to the public. Maybe some of these you do know because you're here in this conference, but there are other people that might not be aware of what's going on, and this is a way to bring um, art and also these important issues in a non-threatening manner, but to make people just to have dialogue. Okay, um, we can take questions, and one of the, um, just to just give a visual context, the cards will have many, many cards, and they'll be life-size, and you, in a gallery space, you would actually walk into these hanging cards, and then there will be decks of cards, very much like the decks of cards that were part of the propaganda machine after 9-11. But these cards will be different because they'll have, without names, what the whistleblowers and the political prisoners, which is part of it, are either what they have done or what they are accused of. And it'll be kind of like a matching of, you'd be trying to match the cards with the life-size um, examples or whistleblowers. And then there's other elements like an area where all the products from 9-11, post 9-11, will be like a store. So we could take questions if you have any questions or ideas or... Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, please forgive me. Okay. Tammy, yeah. Tammy, let me just say that, that Dave had a lead and he asked me to take over the not to give this talk but to just moderate the panel here. So uh, Barry Spun Sociology Department. So the next so Dave won't be able to speak. He had to go to the grad center to uh, teach a course. So uh, after uh, Tammy and Chasha, we have, I guess, one more presentation, which is the ad hoc committee against the militarization of CUNY, which is a mouthful, but a delightful <laughs> mouthful. And um, the talk will be, is entitled State Repression and Student anti Imperialist struggles. I'm brought back to UMass, 1966. <laughs> it's great, and I'm not sure the folks. I don't know this young lady. You're the only presenter. Yeah, I'm the yeah. Only presenter. And you're uh, Freddie. Yes. Freddie. Freddie Bastone. Freddie Bastone is going to make the presentation. So let's uh, give it up to Freddie. First, um, I'm going to just apologize in advance because my, uh, my talk will be a little bit more analytic as opposed to factual. Um, we've been caught up in a lot of work recently. I don't know if anyone's aware, but the Morales Shakur Center um, in City College was recently shut down by the CUNY administration. There's been a lot of work actively on many of the student militant parts on that. Um, uh, the Morales Shakur Center, I'll get into that actually in, in my talk. Um, so the ad hoc committee against the militarization of CUNY, yes, it's a mouthful, but it is a mouthful because it actually was representative of many organizations um, in the CUNY system, including the Revolutionary Student Coordinating Committee, uh, the Internationalist Clubs, and uh, another one to name is the Sister Circle Collective at City College. Um, and the general work of the ad hoc committee has been to resist the, um, the militarization of CUNY, and by that we mean precisely the, um, the introduction of David Petraeus, the former CIA head and commander of armed forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, as a in the teaching slot in uh, Macaulay Honors, as well as the introduction of the Reserve Officer Training Corp uh, (ROTC) in City College, York, Medgar Evers, and College of Staten Island. Um, so the work has started up in late August when a number of uh, people informally had discussions about what needed to be done in regards to the Betrayus appointment. Um, that was consolidated in late August uh, as the ad hoc committee. And basically we've been doing work, um, having protests, facilitating protests um, against Betrayus, uh, targeting the ROTC in particular. Uh, I don't know if people are aware, but there was recently a viral video and you know, the culture jamming part actually struck me because this is precisely part of the campaign strategy, was to not simply have protests as usual, which you just sort of are behind a picket line, 
a, a barrier, there's the cops present, and you really just go home afterward. But to actually embarrass the CUNY administration for appointing who, someone who, in our opinion, is an active war criminal, someone who participates in the military structure of the United States government at the highest levels, at the highest bureaucratic levels, in illegal wars and in illegal activities of those uh, bodies, that being obviously the US military and the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA. Um, so we, we made it you know, our task to embarrass the administration. So there was one video that came out where we basically found Betrayus on the street and we heckled him on the street. Um, this was you know, minor heckling. No one like, physically contacted him, no one touched him. He went into his car, he drove away. But that video got an, a, a very strong response from the CUNY administration, the, um, the US, even to the point where uh, the U United Sta uh, Student Faculty, uh, United Faculty Senate, sorry, um, was, uh, had a statement against us. There was a statement from the, the president of Macaulay Honors. And then um, within next week, uh, next two weeks, we found ourselves being beaten by the police at the next uh, demonstration we had. Uh, six people were arrested. Um, it was, I was there, I saw what happened. The uh, police were utilizing the most interesting of tactics, which was just saying, basically lying. Um, well, they did something of pushing us into the street, then they declared that we were in the street uh, stopping traffic, and then they were basically claiming that we were, like I was getting hit in the chest, for example, with a baton. And as, the, as I was getting hit in the chest, just for anybody who was recording the incident, the cop was saying, don't touch us, don't touch us. And they were like, we were obviously not touching them. They have weapons, they have batons, what are we going to do? Um, so, I mean, that's some of the work we've been doing um, with the uh, ad hoc committee. Um, but, you know, actually, um, the, the repression that's come along with that has been you know, quite interesting in regards of CUNY. Um, the Morales Shakur Center, uh, which is a center named after, uh, um, um, it's named after Asad Shakur, who was a Black Liberation Army, Black Panther um, in the 1970s, who's now in Cuba in exile. And uh, Morales, who is, a, who is a Puerto Rican liberation fighter, who is also in exile in Cuba, was uh, taken over by the CUNY administration. This is a center that was won in the student struggles uh, in the 1980s, actually, at City College, which basically halted tuition advances by the administration. Uh, and it was taken away. It was taken away in the dead of night. They brought the police out, uh, out, for, um, out for it. They shut down this entire campus. They, um, this, was happened, this happened Sunday, so. They shut down the entire campus. They arrested, actually, a, a veteran an army, vet, an army veteran there, who was there actually to be interviewed, and he was wearing his uniform at the time. Um, so there's a videotape that people could see online of, of, of David uh, Sucker, who is a longtime CUNY uh, veteran, uh, a CUNY militant uh, in terms of student struggle, and also a army veteran. And he, he sits there, he calmly gets arrested. Um, so there's that video out there as well. Uh, and just for people to know, if anyone's interested in that, uh, that struggle for that center, there is going to be a protest and a rally Thursday. And the City College students are very serious about their center, even beyond the point of like the militarization campaign. The center, that being taken away from us was a basically, and it's an attempt by the CUNY administration to destroy all possibility, all potentiality of actual radical resistance. And I think they might have mismeasured themselves. They might have mismeasured where the students are at and what are they willing to do to resist. Um, and in that regard, I'll just mention one other measure of the CUNY administration is after our recent uh, battles has been attempting to do, which is on November 25th, the Board of Trustees will be voting on an expressive activities uh, proposal. The expressive activities proposal being brought forward to the Board of Trustees would just basically criminalize dissent at CUNY. Um, it's a proposal that will limit people flyering on campus without the actual approval of administration. It is a proposal that will indeed control any form of protest. You would have to give them advance notice of when you're protesting, where you will be, you, they will designate you, your point of rallying. Uh, this is sort of the new wave of the inter, so this is the new wave of policy of interim Kelly. It's a very hard policy. Take the CUNY centers, 
beat the shit out of the students um, and uh, make sure they have no poten potential ability to reorganize themselves. So we're under attack. We're under serious attack now, even though we are, in a certain sense, have won some strategic victories. Petraeus, for example, is not actually teaching anymore at the Macaulay Honors College. He's now relocated in some secure bunker off in 57th Street in order to teach his classes. So, so I think that is a significant victory. He's still teaching. He's still teaching. Yeah, no, no. Don't get it wrong. He's still teaching. We're still working on that. Um, but, you know, that is obviously hard work. So with that talked about, just explaining the situation of CUNY and the repressive aspects of CUNY, I actually do want to talk about something in regards to the Snowden uh, issue and the phenomenon in relationship to militant students here in CUNY and, and around the country, and as well as militants in general. And then when I say militants, I mean people who actively are resisting state repression um, in the name of social justice, in the name of democracy and progress. Um, so let me just begin with a very simple definition, right? You know, what is the state in the end? You know, for us, from my perspective, the state, and you know, this is a probably a dogmatic, dogmatic way of referring it, but the state in the essence is dictatorship. It is the dictatorship of a class. It is the dictatorship of a people. Of course, that's constructed in, in a complicated way, but in its essential properties, the state has to be a question of monopoly of power, right? There does not exist a state as a simple free associating democracy. Um, it hasn't historically uh, existed in such a way. Well, it has, um, but we have to talk about actually uh, communal societies before the development of class society. So, but, so that is sort of my working conception of the state in its bare essence. Um, so, um, I want to talk about like, you know, the Snowden phenomenon in relationship to that, though. Because the Snowden phenomenon, and not the Snowden phenomenon, but the leaker phenomenon, right? We have Snowden, we have Chelsea Manning, we have, um, we have Julian Assange, all basically, within the last few years, coming out in the forefront, breaking through the sort of ideological superstructure of the state, and through their acts um, of valiant resistance, um, demonstrating the really really dark side of the state apparatus, the state, the side in which basically is not disclosed to us. And when it is disclosed to us, you know, they, be, they, be, they violated some, you know, principle of state, like of state secrecy, and therefore these people have ideologically, have been ideologically, trans, ideologically transformed by the, by the sort of Obama, the Obama administration and others as traitors to this country and to the people broadly. And unfortunately, you know, some of this is, does have some play amongst people. I, you know, I, I'm a construction worker, uh, for example, just to disclose that. And you know, I was recently asked, sent by somebody, you know, you you look like that spy, like because um, like you know, I guess I had a goatee at the time. They were referring to Snowden. That's all they knew. Right? You know, they only knew Snowden was a spy. So like they were tr they were traitors. But real and the reality is for us, right? They've revealed something striking about the state process and how the state is functioning. And they've also revealed actually strong weaknesses in the state. I don't want to presume, right, that the state is actually functionally, like, simply this all-encompassing power. It simply is not. And I, I, will, I will talk about that somewhat. But Snowden, in particular, Assange, um, and Chelsea Manning have really broken through the superstructure. They have they've ruptured the spectacle society in a certain sense. They've culture jammed you know, the existing framework of thought that is, is around sort of the idea of patriotism, loyalty to the state that has appeared in this sort of post 9-11 world, right? So, you know, where the CIA and the, uh, and the Israeli military is producing dramas, right, television dramas for, uh, for ourselves to be consumed that basically have this feel of this sort of like, and I, you know, I, I put it in my sort of way of notes, sort of like this otherization of the enemy, but an otherization of the enemy that is like, it's always internal in the social body, so anybody around you is possibly your enemy, they're possibly someone you don't think they are. This is like sort of like the consistent ideological thing um, that is developed by, by, by that side. We do have with the actual acts, the actual concrete acts of resistance by these individuals, the a breakthrough to show that actually no, 
NSA is not simply focusing on this sort of fake world of the 24 series, but it's actually just compiling just massive data grabs of the hundreds of millions of people within this country and globally around the world. And moreover, they're not even really focusing on those beds of actual terror, right? They're actually focusing on like competing imperialist powers. They're focusing on Russia, they're focusing on China, they're focusing on Germany, right? Brazil, right? They're focusing on actually other state powers. So this actually has this contention, this struggle of actually this new terrain actually exists in a world of geopolitics, of competition between various forces of imperialism, ultra globalization, etc. Um, so you know, like the Chinese, for example, you know, like as we are doing this, the, you know, the Chinese certainly have their own repressive way that's going about it in competition with us. So this is a new terrain of actually state struggle altogether geopolitically, and it has some repercussions for ourselves. Um, so I do want to stress, though, however, that. The reality is, though, that the state is actually not strong in regards to this. It does seem like the NSA, while the NSA may be peering into hundreds of millions of people, there's also just hundreds of millions of people uninformed about basically security measures and how to actually deal with actually the state's incursions on you. Um, you know, obviously we could protest, we could demand, etc., and we should, right? We should definitely do those things. However, simultaneously, we do live in a world where militants are being like focused upon. They are actually, they, you know, NYPD, for example, has secret detachments of people in the Muslim student associations throughout their schools. Uh, they have detachments of people outside of their jurisdiction doing investigatory work on organizations. They have detachments of people inside political organizations. And this is actually facilitated and helped by actually even the CIA, as the NYPD is now receiving training from them. Um, and, you know, they're obviously, if you even barely notice the media today, I mean, even like the recent Boston uh, events where uh, the bombing took place, there was a shutdown of a massive uh, city and a complete militarized, and you saw the pictures, the complete militarization of the, of the police force there. So, what to do, right? Well, you know, we certainly have a task as militants to con consistently resist, to protect ourselves, to fight back. The fight back against the militarization of CUNY, the fight back against the actual repressive uh, tactics of the CUNY administration is one way. Obviously focusing, I'm sorry, give me one sec. Focusing uh, focusing on the defense of Chelsea Manning uh, is one is another way, another venue. We need to build a broad movement of essentially resistance against the state repressive measures. And I'm not simply just talking about just even just um, Snowden, um, Chelsea Manning, but also the the actual real feature of there being a carceral like state to this as well. I mean, we have in this country over two million people in jail. Over 25% of the world's prison population lives within these borders, right? Within the continental United States. There's more people in jail in the United States than there are in China. And China has 1.66 billion people, and it's a one-party dictatorship, right? And this is the democracy. So I think we, that is an easy connection to really make, the actual real feature of the horror behind what is happening. Um, so, but there, there are, other ways too, as conscious militants, I want to also just touch upon. Has anyone actually heard of Silk Road by any chance? Does anyone know about it? All right, Tammy does. All right, so Silk Road was this website that was on uh, the tour, on tour. And basically, I mean, I don't condone what they were doing, but there was this site that basically was facilitating the drug trade through encrypted, uh, encrypted. Um, encrypted um, use of Tor, Explorer. Uh, Tor is an Explorer device. You can download it for free. Uh, it exists online. It's very hard, it's, it's almost impossible to decrypt, actually. The, the, um, so, so basically, the site existed on Tor. You could only access it through Tor. And what ended up happening was that the United States government, you know, FBI eventually busted they the guy. The back, yes. They went through the back end of the encrypted info. 